One of Africa's last great wildernesses, the Nyasa Reserve, lies in the northernmost corner of Mozambique. At 16,000 square miles, it is the size of a small country and supports Mozambique's largest concentration of wildlife. Surprisingly, it is also home to 25,000 people. It is this complex interplay of animals and man that has attracted Colleen and Keith Begg, a husband and wife research team with a special interest in carnivores and a passion for honey badgers. Two years earlier, in the wide open spaces of the Kalahari Desert, the Beggs carried out the first major study of honey badgers. There, they were able to observe firsthand the lives of these charismatic creatures. The care and upbringing of the young, their fierce disposition and ferocious appetite for snakes. They analyzed in detail the amazing relationship that exists between badgers and chanting goshawks. The birds follow the badgers, watching their every move, ready to catch prey flushed by the badgers' frantic digging. For the goshawks, there really is a free lunch. But tales of a more intriguing partnership between bird and badger has sparked the interest of Keith and Colleen. A little bird known as a honey guide is said to lead badgers to beehives by its insistent calling. But some scientists doubt this story and the begs want to discover the truth for themselves. Honey is rare in the Kalahari and honey guides don't occur here. And so to learn more about honey badgers, how they survive in a completely different world, the researchers head north through Mozambique. It's a rough road to Nyasa. A 10-day journey that will take the bags 3,000 miles from their home in South Africa. While it's a long road to Nyasa, it's an even longer road to recovery for post-war Mozambique, where the last landmines are being removed. In colonial times, the Portuguese referred to this remote region as the end of the world. Nyasa province was seldom visited except by the occasional hunters and missionaries. The Begs soon have an inkling of some of the challenges that lie ahead. But everyone is friendly and helpful, which augurs well for the researchers who will need all the help they can get from these people who are known to be skilled honey hunters. Journeys end. The Lugenda River is the lifeblood of the Nyasa Reserve and home to more than 12,000 elephants. They have a new member on the team, Oshka grew up in one of the reserve's largest villages. He's a jack of all trades and a promising bush mechanic. Punctures are a fact of life in this environment and he's undaunted by their daily occurrence. But he retains a healthy respect for Nyasa's largest residents that regularly come to visit. The full spectrum of African animals live around the Begs camp. And it's not long before Colleen finds evidence of badgers nearby. It's a promising start. It would be amazing to be able to follow a badger here. This is just such beautiful habitat. Alberto is Oshka's uncle and an accomplished honey hunter. He's promised to show them how to find beehives with the help of honey guides. Brrr. 
but Alberto surprises them by calling in a honey guide with a sound that is familiar. It's a noise made by an excited honey badger. Saki meju maki. Mele saki. Ese pau aqui grande. Generations of honey hunters like Alberto have followed honey guides to hives. But do the birds also entice badgers to follow them? While Alberto smokes out the hive, the honey guide waits nearby for scraps of waxy honeycomb, reward for its help in finding this hive. Keith and Colleen are greatly impressed by Alberto's intimate knowledge of both honey guides and bees. They are especially intrigued by his use of what appears to be a honey badger sound to attract the birds. He tells them it's a call his father taught him. It's a good haul of honey. Alberto's 16 children will be happy to see their father today. Alberto joins the Badger team. His bush skills will complement Oshka's village education. He's putting the finishing touches to his new bed. With so few roads, the easiest way to explore Nyasa and eventually find badgers will be from the air. Alberto and Oshka have some serious doubts. This man actually believes he's going to fly? Viva the honey badger. But from Keith's vantage point, it's clear to him that finding and following badgers in this terrain is a daunting prospect. <laughs> but uh, uh, Muto Hippopot, Hippopotum, yeah. Ali. <laughs> Alberto introduces Keith and Colleen to Ibu, an elder and a highly respected fisherman. He is said also to be a daring honey hunter. He's mystified why anyone should want to go to so much effort to find a honey badger. Fishing is the main activity of Keith and Colleen's neighbors. The fishing camp is always busy as traps are being made and repaired under Ibu's watchful eye. Fishing is a family affair and even Ibu's youngest son, Somani, prepares his own nets.
Time spent with the fishermen is a fascinating glimpse into a vanishing culture, and soon the begs find that they have their trust and acceptance. <laughs> Keith and Colleen will come to rely on this family who live so close to nature and who lead such different lives. Back at the badger camp, preparations are also underway to find and catch those elusive badgers. While Keith makes traps, Oshka suits special plates that will reveal the tracks of badgers or any animal that walks over them to get to the bait. It's a useful way to learn which carnivores are in the area. Colleen finds that small carnivores like genets have been attracted to the bait, but as yet, no badgers. The begs are giving the fishermen a film show about their work in the Kalahari. Ibu is enchanted. And when she does, the cub is about three months old. He's revealed this is a surefire way to show the fishermen what they hope to achieve in Nyasa. Though for the honey hunters like Ibu, badgers are usually regarded only as competition for honey. One day, he's one of the last bushmen, or San, born here, who can still read the language of the Sands. When we first got here, I think we were oh, 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 the whole place seems so vast and unfamiliar. Despite their name, honey is not the badger's staple diet. Snakes are the favorite item on their menu. They can eat 30 feet of snake in less than three days. Ibu is suitably impressed. He pledges to share his knowledge with Mama and Papa. Ibu's ancestors have lived in this wilderness for thousands of years. The ancient paintings on this rock near his village speak of man's long presence here. Ibu introduces the begs to the ancient rhythms of his world one still intricately linked to nature. A carefully forged axe blade is essential to living here. Every man should have his own dugout, and the fishermen are making this one for Keith. Asani reads the natural lines of the tree. A master craftsman of canoes, he'll make this one with a single axe blade. By simply changing the blade's orientation in a variety of handles, he makes different tools. It is back-breaking work, and it will take him a week on his own to craft each uniquely shaped canoe. Along the river, and despite the ever-present danger, Somani and his young friends are honing their fishing skills. Like otters, they chase fish through the rocky channels into their carefully arranged nets. And when two hands aren't enough, one must simply make a plan. Sometimes they flush out the unexpected, but this crocodile is gently released. 
Together, the children make their own contribution to the family pot and have fun too. The canoe is almost ready. Asani is making his finishing touches. The seasoned fisherman, Ibu, approves. And Keats' dugout hitches a ride to the river. Can anything as heavy as this ever float? Ibu seems confident. <laughs> But all is well, and Asani has reason to be proud. Ibu puts the canoe through his paces. And then it's time for the new owner to try his luck. <laughs> it's a tricky business staying upright. <laughs> but eventually, Keith salvages a little respect. Each day, the search for the badgers continues. Colleen leaves smelly little treats in the traps while Alberto lays enticing scent trails from his bucket of offal to draw the badgers to the traps. It's thirsty work, but Alberto quickly reveals another of Nyasa's secrets. Hey! Can you see agua? Can you see Yeah, poco. <laughs> Camp life settles into an easy routine. Oshka has learned to bake bread over the campfire and the fishermen provide a welcome change from dried beans and canned food. It's a waiting game now, waiting for a badger to walk into a trap. The hippos too are resting. They favor the deepest pools in the river for their all-day siestas. These same pools are excellent fishing grounds, so the hippos will be encouraged to go elsewhere led by Ibu's son, Mario, an orderly takeover occurs. The fishermen cautiously make their way, keeping as close to the bank as possible. Hippos are said to kill more people in Africa than any other animal, but these fishermen appear to be quite confident. They make for the rock in the center of the pool, the one the hippos lie around. From here, armed only with a handful of stones. The hippos are reminded to keep their distance while the nets are prepared for a night of fishing. Appearing like giant fireflies, the fishermen begin to lay their nets. Each man must keep balance in his leaky craft, watch his fire, and be on guard for the ever-present crocodiles. Mario tests his balance to the limit as he drives fish towards the nets. The bags are active at night too, exploring the woodland as part of their endless search for badgers. 
During their night drives, they have already discovered that Nyasa is home to a large population of endangered African wild dogs. Other carnivores such as African civet, hyena and lion are regularly seen. They also encounter many of Nyasa's more elusive creatures like aardvark and pangolin. They've already found 24 species of carnivore living here. But as yet, no honey badgers have been seen. Back in camp, they find they have a visitor. This leopard cannot resist the enticing smell of offal coming from the bait bucket. Excuse me. <laughs> While the hippos wait impatiently upstream, the fishermen lift their nets. Their catch is small with some collateral damage to those caught stealing from the nets. The fishing camp is a hive of activity as the night's catch comes in. Fish are being sorted and smoked before being sold to traders. This is a tense moment for Ibu. He bargains hard for the best deal. His family depend on it. Little cash changes hands. Instead, fish are the currency and are bartered for everything from bicycle parts and batteries to food and clothing. When the deals are done, the fish are transported through the bush for more than 100 miles to markets in neighboring Tanzania. At last, Alberto has found the telltale scratches of a honey badger on the bark of a baobab underneath a beehive. And a trap is set at the base of the tree. The next morning, the team faces a serious problem. Big leopard in the cage. Okay. I don't like this at all. Neither does the leopard. Keith thought his traps would be too small for the larger predators. The leopard is furious and extremely dangerous. Keith must cover the cage to minimize the leopard's reaction to him. It's not a plan for the faint-hearted. The idea now is to tie the tape to the door of the trap. Once attached to the top of the door, the tape can be pulled from a safer distance to release the leopard. Ibu has invited the researchers to a honey harvest. 
At least five hives are lodged impossibly high in a magnificent baobab. Ibu calls this tree chief of the baobabs and returns here every year to harvest honey. He assures the bags that tomorrow honey guys will be attracted from his activities tonight. Keith and Colleen hope they'll be able to observe the bird's behavior in more detail and maybe even a honey badger will appear. Ibu's harvest is a deadly serious affair. His life will depend on meticulous preparation which will take him and his trusted friend Laini the rest of the day. They make a lightweight ladder. The cross treads are tied with bark rope. The knots are crucial. They must be strong enough to allow Ibu to hang safely high above the ground. This old ladder and the stakes used last year must all be replaced. This is old bushcraft handed down from father to son. When enough stakes have been made, bamboo is split to make the torches that will light Ibu's way and help subdue the angry bees. Meanwhile, a cloud of stingless bees makes life difficult for everyone. When all is ready, Ibu performs the final and most essential task. He prays to the spirit of the great tree. A dark night is especially chosen by Ibu. It might offer him some protection from the bees' painful stings. In somber mood, he gathers his new stakes and begins the ascent. As he climbs, he methodically replaces last year's stakes. And to avoid attracting the bees, he climbs in complete darkness. Only when he is dangerously high in the tree does he haul up a flaming torch to light his way and to try to subdue the bees that are becoming alert to the raid. Armed only with a torch, he inches towards the first and largest of the hives from which thousands of alarmed bees are swarming out. He'll be stung countless times as he wields his torch. But now he must concentrate only on attaching his new ladder. From the ladder, he will hang precariously alongside the large combs with their angry occupants. While he continues to scorch the bees, he removes the combs from the hive. Some old pieces are simply thrown down. But choice combs are placed in a bowl and lowered to the ground for collection by Mario. While Ibu raids above, those below enjoy his hard-won spoils. Tonight, Ibu will remain in the tree collecting combs for five continuous hours until about 50 pounds of honeycomb have been harvested. By dawn, the hives have been stripped bare and the promised honey guides are arriving in numbers never before seen by the bags. Perhaps a badger might also appear attracted by the smell of the honey. Some of the old honeycombs have been left on the ground for the honey guides who are one of very few animals that can digest wax. A 
a goshawk takes advantage of the feasting birds to grab a meal. But no badgers show up this day. They know the routine by now. Still, some scary moments. Ainda. An interesting variety of visitors get trapped and released, but the animal they came to study has yet to be seen, and soon the rainy season will bring all work to a halt. It had all been so different in the desert. Catching and following badgers had at the time seemed difficult enough on the soft dunes of the Kalahari. But the open terrain and long legs were usually a winning combination. Even the feistiest honey badger could seldom avoid Keats' net. And in three years, more than 70 were caught and released, providing a wealth of information never before obtained. In Nyasa, everything seems conspired against them. Even the punctures take on nightmare dimensions. And then, stricken with malaria, their busy camp routine grinds to a halt as repeated attacks take their toll. Alberto thinks he has a solution. He believes they must ask the help of the ancestors. Particularly the great chief Nantusi, who lived in this area many generations ago. Keith and Colleen are skeptical, but intrigued. They are prepared to try anything to break their run of bad luck. Alberto has arranged a meeting with the current chief, Namanya, who agrees to take them to a sacred grave. For the people of this area, it is natural to ask for help from their ancestors, and Keith and Colleen are touched by the concern and generosity of these folk, who are willing to appeal to the great chief on their behalf. <laughs> At the gravesite, they find the broken remains of previous offerings. They add grain and some money. Led by Ibu, they pay their respects and ask for help. Five days later, a badger is found in one of the traps. Its appearance doesn't seem to surprise Alberto as much as it does the researchers. The procedure now is one they know so well. They have done it before with countless badgers. It will take a few minutes before the drugs take effect and Colleen can examine the badger. A radio collar is placed around his neck. The receiver is tuned and this young male is prepared for release. In less than an hour of being immobilized, the badger recovers and trots away. This is what they have come to Nyasa for, to follow the adventures of a badger in woodland.
The rainy season is almost upon them, but a lot of hope is pinned on this little fellow. The researchers want to track him for as long as possible. Gradually, their badger becomes used to being followed through the woodland by a noisy Land Rover. He spends a lot of his time digging for the larvae of giant wood-boring beetles. They are filling and a rich source of protein. He seems to relish them and eats little else. As seasonal fires sweep through the woodlands, it becomes easier to negotiate the rugged terrain. The researchers hope it'll make sightings of their badger easier too. But their sightings are fleeting. Instead, they simply follow his signal as he trots through the bush. Wherever they can, they use elephant paths, but their badger rarely uses the same easy route. Sometimes their parts are pitted with huge elephant footprints that wreak havoc on their aging Land Rover and must be cleared. Keeping track of this wily beast is an exhausting business. They get little sleep. They live for the brief sightings of their little subject. Finally, the rains call a halt. The channels that have been dry for months begin to flow. Following the badger will be impossible through the coming deluge. Confined to the camp, the researchers hunker down, catch up with their records and brace themselves for the trials of camp life in the rain. Rainy season here is brief but heavy. Most rains fall in just four months. Everyone in camp must entertain themselves as best they can while the river continues to swell and spreads across the maze of once dry channels. The rains transform Nyasa. It's a time of joyful activity, abundant grazing and easy living. But it is no picnic for the researchers as they try to follow a faint signal through a quagmire. They know their badger is out there, but they are just too bogged down to find him. One possibility is to try and pinpoint the signal from the air. But when Keith sees the full extent of the flooded river and the maze of channels, he realizes the hopelessness of trying to follow a badger in these conditions. No, nothing. All they can do now is wait for Nyasa to dry and continue to scan for signals from the mountain tops. And then at last, after weeks of searching, a faint signal is picked up. Their badger is on an island in the River Rhine forest. Lion tracks are far easier to spot than badger. A faint signal points ahead, but dangerous animals are all about. Suddenly, the elephants are upstaged by exciting news. Just what they wanted, another badger to double their chances of success. Okay, muito bom. Não sou andar agora mesmo. Obrigado. Kikuli. Sim. Eca, esse é bom. Aonde? Aqui será doer aqui. Pode dar esse Kikuli. 
Non. Et c'est une culinade de fougie, bien. Il y a de la grande. Ok. A large older male badger is in the trap. In no time, the samples and records have been taken, and the badger is carefully returned to the open trap, where he can recover close to the same honeycomb that originally attracted him. His groggy confusion will soon wear off, and Keith and Colleen know that in a few minutes he'll be trotting about without any memory of this strange experience. Colleen is sending email via radio signal to an old friend, renowned wildlife veterinarian, Dr. Mike Cock. The badger's lifestyle isn't well suited to radio collars, and it is best to implant a radio transmitter. Captured for a second time, the big male badger can't resist Keith and Colleen's bait. He seems frustrated by the situation and hides his head and waits. But on release, he instantly regains his feistiness and tries to exact revenge. <laughs> A lifetime spent traveling and working in remote locations, my cock is best placed to implant a radio transmitter into the abdominal cavity of the badger. It's a simple procedure, yet always stressful for all concerned. Mike has traveled from South Africa to perform the operation for Keith and Colleen. All goes well and the patient is soon ready for release. As ever, the badger recovers rapidly and within minutes is up and about. The challenge of keeping up with the badgers in the woodland is exacting a heavy toll on the vehicle and constant repairs are necessary. Fortunately, Oshka has developed into a masterful bush mechanic and one way or another, the vehicles are kept on the road. Happiness in this remote place is a vehicle that goes. But for pure joy, nothing beats the sound of signals from two badgers. Five degrees apart, but probably about 10 k. Once located, the arduous task of following the badgers begins again. They have decided to stay with a younger male who is spending most of his time rooting around in soft sand. With his amazing sense of smell, he's able to locate frogs and nutritious beetle larvae buried deep in the sand. But the weather is hot and most of the badger's foraging is done at night when honey guides are sleeping. And as in the Kalahari, the begs are finding that the badgers have unusually large home ranges. The young male roams over at least 170 square miles. He's forever on the move and the researchers must follow as best they can. After weeks of this routine, the badger rewards his followers with a night of surprises. 
he discovers a beehive deep inside a marula tree. The entrance is narrow and he struggles to enter. His pawing and scratching at the entrance arouses the bees. They swarm out to defend their hive, but the badger is undeterred. This is a situation for which Keith and Colleen are well prepared. The badger gets many stings. They irritate, but he's a tough little fellow and keeps on trying. He manages to claw out a few pieces of honeycomb, and now there is no stopping him. Gradually, he forces his way right up into the hive, where he remains only long enough to become coated in honey. Emerging from the hive covered in sticky honey, he licks the spoils from his fur. He then surprises the researchers by walking away from the hive, collecting soot and sand on his sticky fur to again forage for more savory snacks in the sand. He does something the researchers have seldom seen a badger do. Perhaps thirsty after all the honey, he stops to drink before trotting back into the woodland. It becomes obvious that he's heading back to the hive for another round. Once again, he squeezes his way into the narrow entrance. But this time, he remains there until dawn. A honey guide now makes an appearance. The very first time the researchers have ever seen a badger and a honey guide together. But now, there is a problem. Bloated from a night in the hive, he's now too fat to get out and becomes firmly wedged in the hive entrance. These struggles are anxious moments for Keith and Colleen. But before they can decide what to do, he manages to wriggle free. For only a brief moment, he appears stunned. But then, he remembers the tasty chunk of honeycomb he saw on the way down. It's just what a fellow needs after all that exercise. The badger appears to take no notice of the honey guide. Over the next few months, their badgers find more hives, but the begs never see a honey badger together with a honey guide again. So what of the story of the honey guide and the badger? After 12 years studying badgers, the Beggs believe that badgers, with their extraordinary sense of smell and good climbing ability, have little need of help from birds to find hives. But maybe, like the chanting goshawks in the Kalahari, it is the honey guide looking for a free meal that follows the badger, not the other way around. And as honey guides are known to lead man to hives, when bird and badger were seen together, a tale was born. The story of the Beg's pursuit of badgers has been as much about adventure as it has been about research. For now, the badgers have won, and it's time to leave them. And time for Keith and Colleen to say goodbye to the people who helped them 
and for Alberto and Oshka to return to their families. Nyasa has become a part of Keith and Colleen. They are taking away the memories of their time here, but they'll leave the mystery of the badgers and honey guides in the wilderness where it belongs. Not all mysteries can be solved. And wasn't there reward enough? live around the Beggs camp. And it's not long before Colleen finds evidence of badgers nearby. It's a promising start. It would be amazing to be able to follow a badger here. This is just such beautiful habitat. Alberto is Oshka's uncle and an accomplished honey hunter. He's promised to show them how to find beehives with the help of honey guides. So But Alberto surprises them by calling in a honey guide with a sound that is familiar. It's a noise made by an excited honey badger. Generations of honey hunters like Alberto have followed honey guides to hives. But do the birds also entice badgers to follow them? While Alberto smokes out the hive, the honey guide waits nearby for scraps of waxy honeycomb, reward for its help in finding this hive. <laughs> Keith and Colleen are greatly impressed by Alberto's intimate knowledge of both honey guides and bees. They are especially intrigued by his use of what appears to be a honey badger sound to attract the birds. He tells them it's a call his father taught him. Tooth for themselves. Honey is rare in the Kalahari, and honey guys don't occur here. And so to learn more about honey badgers, how they survive in a completely different world, the researchers head north through Mozambique. It's a rough road to Nyasa. A 10-day journey that will take the bags 3,000 miles from their home in South Africa. While it's a long road to Nyasa, it's an even longer road to recovery for post-war Mozambique, where the last landmines are being removed. In colonial times, the Portuguese referred to this remote region as the end of the world. Nyasa province was seldom visited except by the occasional hunters and missionaries. The Begs soon have an inkling of some of the challenges that lie ahead. 
but everyone is friendly and helpful, which augurs well for the researchers who will need all the help they can get from these people who are known to be skilled honey hunters. Journeys end. The Lujenda River is the lifeblood of the Nyasa Reserve and home to more than 12,000 elephants. They have a new member on the team. Oshka grew up in one of the reserve's largest villages. He's a jack of all trades and a promising bush mechanic. Punctures are a fact of life in this environment and he's undaunted by their daily occurrence. But he retains a healthy respect for Nyasa's largest residents that regularly come to visit. The full spectrum of African animals One of Africa's last great wildernesses, the Nyasa Reserve, lies in the northernmost corner of Mozambique. At 16,000 square miles, it is the size of a small country and supports Mozambique's largest concentration of wildlife. Surprisingly, it is also home to 25,000 people. It is this complex interplay of animals and man that has attracted Colleen and Keith Begg, a husband and wife research team with a special interest in carnivores and a passion for honey badgers. Two years earlier, in the wide open spaces of the Kalahari Desert, the Beggs carried out the first major study of honey badgers. There, they were able to observe firsthand the lives of these charismatic creatures. The care and upbringing of the young, their fierce disposition and ferocious appetite for snakes. They analyzed in detail the amazing relationship that exists between badgers and chanting goshawks. The birds follow the badgers, watching their every move, ready to catch prey flushed by the badgers' frantic digging. For the goshawks, there really is a free lunch. But tales of a more intriguing partnership between bird and badger has sparked the interest of Keith and Colleen. A little bird known as a honey guide is said to lead badgers to beehives by its insistent calling. But some scientists doubt this story and the begs want to discover the truth. <laughs> but uh uh hippopot hippopotum? Yeah. Ali Alberto introduces Keith and Colleen to Ibu, an elder, and a highly respected fisherman. He is said also to be a daring honey hunter. He's mystified why anyone should want to go to so much effort to find a honey badger. Fishing is the main activity of Keith and Colleen's neighbors. The fishing camp is always busy as traps are being made and repaired under Ibu's watchful eye. Fishing is a family affair and even Ibu's youngest son, Somani, prepares his own nets. Time spent with the fishermen is a fascinating glimpse into a vanishing culture, and soon the begs find that they have their trust and acceptance. 
Uh, muito obrigado. Yeah. Yeah. Obrigado, Zé. Keith and Colleen will come to rely on this family who lives so close to nature and who lead such different lives. Back at the badger camp, preparations are also underway to find and catch those elusive badgers. While Keith makes traps, Oshka suits special plates that will reveal the tracks of badgers or any animal that... It's a good haul of honey. Alberto's 16 children will be happy to see their father today. Alberto joins the Badger team. His bush skills will complement Oshka's village education. He's putting the finishing touches to his new bed. With so few roads, the easiest way to explore Nyasa and eventually find badgers will be from the air. Alberto and Oshka have some serious doubts. This man actually believes he's going to fly? Viva the honey badger. But from Keith's vantage point, it's clear to him that finding and following badgers in this terrain is a daunting prospect. <laughs> 